Okay, great. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Martin Kleppmann, our speaker today. Martin is a research fellow at the Computer Lab and probably best known as the uh, author of this wonderful book, Designing Data Intensive Applications from O'Reilly Media. There's a nice animal in front. <laughs> yeah. I don't know which one it is though. But, uh, wild boar, I think. A yeah, wild boar, okay. Yeah. Uh, he works in distributed systems and security and in particular CRDPs. And in the past, he's been a software engineer, entrepreneur, and worked on large scale data infrastructure at LinkedIn. So, thank you for the talk. We're all yours. Great. Thank you, Kesha. And uh, yes, thank you for coming, both those in person and those online. Um, I hope you. I hope the microphone is picking me up well. So, complain if if it doesn't. Um, so yes, I'd like to try and sort of give a summary of essentially what have I been what I've been up to over the last six years or so. Um, because quite a lot has happened, um, and the, it's, it all centers around uh, this open source project called Automerge, but there are also a bunch of research projects that have fed into that. So I'll start by motivating what this is all about, and then uh, later talk about a bit more of the technical details of what's going on inside it. Um, so thank you to my fellowship sponsors and so on. Um, also have a, a Patreon account that I've been experimenting with as an alternative way of funding research. Um, so the context here is collaboration software. So probably all of you have used this for working together with people on text documents or on spreadsheets or on LaTeX documents um, or for tracking tasks in Trello or for vector graphics in some, something like Figma or um, maybe more technical things like CAD applications or building plans for buildings and all sorts of things like all sorts of software involves people collaborating and the architecture of how this type of software has built has changed a bit over time so in the sort of historic era of uh, web applications that the traditional way of building a web application was you have a server it's, it's running some kind of server-side programming language maybe php or node or or python or ruby or something like that it stores its data in a database on the server, and then uh, the server sends some HTML to the client, and the client responds by submitting some forms. And then we decided that that was too slow and clunky, and so we put a whole lot of JavaScript on the client side, um, which now talks to the server, usually using some kind of JSON-based API. Now, this architecture has a bunch of problems, uh, even though it's very widely used. And one of the problems is that there are just so many layers of abstraction on top of each other. So you want to display some data in the web browser, so you use the HTML DOM to render some data, um, and the JavaScript that's running on the client side probably represents its state of the application in some in-memory objects uh, as JavaScript objects, and those objects get updated based on user input. But now, if you want to actually persist anything, well, that has to go to a server, and the server needs to talk via some kind of um, protocol, something that you can turn into bytes that you can send over the wire in some kind of RPC or REST API. And so usually that involves the JavaScript state being turned into some JSON objects and being posted to a server, and then the server posting some, uh, responding with some more JSON objects, which get decoded into JavaScript application objects, which then get rendered into the web browser. But it doesn't stop there because on the server side, you receive some JSON and you need to send some JSON. The server itself has to operate on objects in some kind of programming language, whatever programming language it's using. So the JSON gets encoded and decoded into some model objects on the server side, which then get actually mapped into data that needs to be stored on the database in some form or another. So usually there's something like an object relational mapping library or ORM, which takes in-memory objects in your favorite server side programming language and turns them into SQL queries so that you can then be stored in a SQL database. And the SQL database itself is just another abstraction layer on top of a disk, which turns uh, a some kind of abstraction of relations and tables into some bytes that are actually stored on a disk somewhere. And if you think of it, this, this is complete madness because we've got vast amounts of code, which are really just converting data from one format into another, into another, into another, going through all of the levels of this stack. So that's not all of it. There are also other problems. Let's say you have a user interacting with some application on a web browser, user clicks a button, this button press gets handled by some JavaScript event handler, which then decides that it needs to store some data on the server. So it makes an HTTP request to some server. 
which then executes some code and maybe does some database queries. And all along, while the server is doing that, well, the web browser is just waiting, waiting, and it's showing a spinner, showing a spinner, showing a spinner, waiting for a response from the server. And eventually, a response comes in from the server, which calls again some JavaScript code as a callback on the client side, which then updates the user interface to say, yes, OK, it's all fine. Except this, that is such a painful wait with all of this, uh, all of this spinning. The JavaScript applications then decided, ah, why don't we just immediately update the user interface to say it's OK, even though the HTTP request hasn't actually completed yet. And we're going to call this optimistic UI. And uh, well, this is fine as long as the HTTP request to the server actually fails. Uh, it's not so fine if your internet uh, connection is not so reliable. So maybe you are sitting in a coffee shop where the Wi-Fi is somewhat flaky. And so the HTTP request gets sent, but you never get a response. And you never know whether the server actually received that request or not. All you can do really is time out. And now you have the problem that your user interface already got get updated to say that it's OK. And now it turns out that actually it's not OK after all. And so now you have to somehow revert the user interface and apologize to the user and somehow clear up the whole mess. And the whole thing is really just a nightmare. And so we've got all of these problems with this um, web application model programming model. Um, I mentioned two. One is the many layers of abstraction and data format conversions, and then the problems of handling unreliability on the network. What I'd like to propose is an alternative, different approach to building this type of software. And we called this local first software in, a, in an essay that uh, some collaborators and I wrote a few years ago. And um, most of the research I've been doing is really in, in some form or another trying to enable this vision of local first software. And the basic principle of local first software is actually very simple, which is contrasting with the traditional model for web applications. Like traditionally, it's been the case that the only uh, durable storage that we really want to assume is on the server. And so if any data is not stored in the database on the server, then it didn't really happen from the point of view of the application, which also implies that if you can't reach the server, the client is somehow disconnected or doesn't have an internet connection right now, it basically can't do it. The client can't really do anything at all. In contrast, the local first model changes this around and says that actually we can store data on the client. You know, it's got a disk as well. So why don't we treat the data storage on the client as the primary form of data storage? And we can still have a server, and the server can just be a mechanism for essentially syncing data from one client to another. And it can be a backup in case you lose your phone. Um, but this vastly simplifies the model of thinking about things because now the client is only reacting to its own local storage. The own local storage is fast and it's reliable because there's no network hop in the way. All it needs to do now is you've got some client side application, which uh, when the user clicks a button, it writes some data persistent to its local disk and immediately updates the user interface. And it's okay, and it really is okay, because we're not going to some later suddenly change our mind about whether this was okay or not. And then in the background, as and when you have an internet connection, we can perform a synchronization protocol, which takes the data in the device's local storage and uploads it to a server, or maybe even sends it peer-to-peer -to, -peer to other clients. And um, this synchronization protocol does not hold up the user interface in, in any way. This is just a background process that is then used um, in order to make sure that the data eventually ends up on the devices of any collaborators who also have a, who should also have a copy of this. Now, also this problem with the many layers of abstraction is vastly simplified in the local first model because we essentially halve the number of data representations that we're dealing with. We have the, um, still we have the JavaScript application state, which is um, more or less an unchanged kind of thing. But here we can employ a library such as AutoMerge, which I will talk about later, um, which now gives a mechanism for persisting that, um, that data to a local disk, and which also provides a synchronization protocol that can then be used to sync that data to a server and to any other client. And the nice thing here now is that this, this storage and synchronization protocol is a general purpose component. It's just, it's just a library that can be used much like you would use a database it's an abstraction for storing some data, uh, and it just happens to work really nicely in this model where 
we store some data locally on the client and then sync it to others. Yes. So I think isn't there like a philosophical debate about what is the meaning of persistence if it's local? I mean, if it's on your laptop and your disk or, or SSD and you happen to lose it or drop it or whatever and it goes away, mm -hmm. somehow that feels, at least in the traditional view of the world, it's not. It's, it's, it's a likely event as opposed to being sent to the back end where it's persisted across multiple disks or multiple locations and so on. So philosophically, what you're proposing is a lighter way of meaning of the word persistence. You could argue that, but I mean, I think users understand that if they change some data on their laptop and they are currently disconnected from the internet, then that data is only stored on their laptop. And if they lose their laptop, then that data will be gone. And right. only once they've synced it to somewhere else, then the- Right, but if you're doing syncing as a background process, mm. then it's not within, you know, so I may be disconnected for, let's say, even two, three days, yep. perhaps, right? And, I, and so if my mental model is that, um, uh, I don't know when I have internet connectivity. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. I'm not even really paying attention to it. But when I don't want to click it, it says, okay, that it's saved. And in fact, it isn't because it hasn't been synced up. Mm. Then that's a mental um, model problem. Yeah, so there's, there's a really interesting problem there. Like, how do we design the user interfaces yeah. in a way to communicate that subtlety to users? Okay. I, I agree. Okay, that's fair. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so let's distinguish. Uh, cloud software, traditional cloud software, and local first software in a, in a few more um, dimensions. So I talked about um, unavailability um, in terms of like your internet connection going down, but there's also another form of unavailability, which is the service goes away entirely, maybe because the, the, it's actually some app provided by a startup and the startup goes out of business and they just decide to shut everything down and give you two weeks notice to export your data as a bunch of JSON files that you can't actually import into any other software. So that may be that or um, another thing that could happen is like it's some Google service and Google just decides from one day to another to block access to your account because apparently they do that to millions of accounts uh, per year, apparently maybe for violating the terms of service or whatever. Um, if you get in trouble with if you ever get in trouble with the service provider, Essentially, with cloud software, you just lose access to all of your data. All of your data that you ever created with the service is gone. Whereas with local first software, the software is just on your local machine, the files are on your local machine, and it's really much harder for anybody to take that away from you. Um, in terms of the software development that goes into building this type of software, with cloud software, we've ended up with this world in which every app has its own custom services often a whole bunch of different services talking to a bunch of different databases and it requires operations teams that look after those services to make sure that they're highly available because whenever the service goes down people can't do any work so it's really important that the available services are available which means you need an operations team that's available and responds to phone calls 24 7 which means that this is expensive, which means that it's actually really expensive to implement these services because you need all of these people looking after it. Whereas with local first software, we have the potential to have a generic cloud service that is just a data syncing service. And all it essentially does is shift some bytes back and forth. And there's no need for every single app developer to have their own custom server side component, but we could have just a simple, simple a uh, syncing service that is provided generically by companies like AWS or Dropbox or Azure or others, and they just give you a generic syncing service for local first apps, and you can plug in all of your local first software, regardless of whether it's a spreadsheet or a text editor or some other kind of software, they can all be plugged into a generic data synchronization layer. Another problem I worry about with cloud software is the long term preservation. So that is um, will historians in 100 years still be able to open the files that we create today? And I personally don't have great confidence that our Google Docs will still be readable in 100 years time. Whereas if it's a file on your local computer and some software that can be preserved in an emulator, that seems like a bit more of a chance, having sending a bit more of a chance of being uh, archivable long term. Um, offline support is really fiddly and tricky to implement in traditional cloud software because it's just not built around client-side state really. It's, it treats client-side state as, as a cache and optimization, not as a form of data storage, whereas local first software simply works by default. If you're offline, there's simply no problem there. 
because it's designed that way in the, in the first place. Another aspect is security, which I find very interesting. And that is generally with cloud software, you're always trusting the, the server with unencrypted data. So the contents of your Google Docs, the contents of any files you create on most cloud services are just stored in plain text on the server. They use encryption over TLS when they send it to you over the internet. They might even use encryption at rest on their disks, but still the servers are processing the data in plain text as they are reading it from disk and sending it out to you. The difference with local first software is that we've moved all of the interesting logic to the client side. And so therefore we can actually use end-to-end -end encryption protocols. So the types of protocols that Signal and WhatsApp and iMessage and so use so that the servers don't actually have access to the plain text anymore, um, but the server is just uh, pushing some encrypted data blobs back and forth and uh, the decryption only happens on the clients. So we can really improve the security properties here. Moreover, we can improve the data integrity guarantees because again, with cloud software, we are generally having to trust the server to just do everything correctly and not to corrupt our data. Um, with the data synchronization protocols we've built, we can actually have cryptographic integrity checks on all of the synchronized data and we can attach signatures to it. And that way one client can be sure in a cryptographic sense that the data it has is exactly the same as the data that another client has and that the synchronization has been done correctly and not been corrupted along the way. And so finally, I feel that um, local first software simply gives users more agency, more control over their data because they're not at the mercy of some remote service provider who might lock them out any moment, but the files are simply yours, they're on your own device. It's a, a much better sense of data ownership, especially for data that is important to the users who've created it. Now, the big challenge with local first software, kind of the, the central challenge really, is now concurrency control is different because you have got each user has a copy of the data on their local disk, and they might change it independently from each other. So you might have the, the red user and the blue user who each have a text document, and they might edit that document while offline. And of course, we always want to allow them to do this editing while offline. And uh, so this means that now the red user, for example, might insert the word world before the exclamation mark, and the blue user might insert the smiley face after the exclamation mark. And we want some nice way of being able to merge these changes together so that it's fine for users to perform these kind of edits concurrently. And in this particular example, it's quite reasonable how we might merge those. We just preserve both of those insertions in the text document so that the, the end, end result has the word world before the exclamation mark and the smile after the exclamation mark. But you can end up also with a lot trickier cases that are not as obvious how you should um, merge those together again. Um, another example of merging might be if you have a to-do list. So you might represent a to-do list as a JSON document. Uh, in this case, I've got two items on the to-do list, buying milk and watering the plants. And let's say on one device, the user checks the box uh, on watering the plants to indicate that that item has been done. And on a different device, the user uh, adds a new item to do the laundry um, and adds that to the end of the to-do list. And so again, what we want is we've ended up with two divergent copies of this data, and we want to be able to merge them together in a way that is sensible and hopefully preserves the properties that the application wants. And so in this case, again, the, the merge is reasonably clear. What we can do is just preserve the fact that watering plants has been done and that doing the laundry has been added as a, as a third item to the list. And so enabling this kind of tracking what has changed from one version of, of a piece of data to another version and then merging those together, that's really the, the central thing that, um, that AutoMerge and our research has been exploring. Now, there's an interesting thing here. If we're already doing this handling of divergent copies of, of some data, um, and already got a mechanism for merging together different copies, this actually opens some new opportunities as well. Now, in traditional server-side software, the way we normally think about the state is that the, the application is always displaying the latest state to the user. And for a Google Doc, for example, there's one version of the Google Doc, and everyone who has it open 
on their screens is showing the same Google Doc. They might be slightly outdated if, if the network is slow right now or if somebody is disconnected, but if everyone's online and collaborating uh, safe, collaborating fine, then there's essentially just one copy of the document and everyone is immediately applying their edits to that one copy. Whereas with local first, in order to enable this offline working, we've already accepted the fact that we're going to have different versions of a file on different devices and those versions, different users files are going to diverge a bit and we need a mechanism for propagating the changes and to merge them back together again. Now, if we already have this mechanism for dealing with different versions of a file, this is actually a fantastic opportunity because it means that we can do things like version control and build that into applications at a very fundamental level. And since that is, this version control is essentially what we have to do anyway in order to enable the data synchronization, um, this actually open, opens a new opportunity for new features for the users as well. And so we as software developers uh, are incredibly privileged to have stuff like Git, like version control systems that allow us to recover old versions of a file, that allow people to work on a branch for a while and then merge that branch in when they're ready to, to share their work with the rest of the team. And really many, many other professions would also really benefit from this sort of version control they simply don't have it at the moment because version control systems like Git basically only work on plain text. If you try to check a spreadsheet into a Git repository, well, it'll just treat it as a binary file. And if you have a merge conflict on that spreadsheet, then good luck because you're just going to have to resolve it by hand. There's, there's absolutely no mechanism for dealing with that. But since we're already in the business of dealing with multiple versions of a file, we can actually do this kind of um, we can do this kind of conflict resolution automatically for all sorts of different types of file. And that means we can hopefully actually bring Git-like uh, asynchronous collaboration workflows to a much broader set of applications, to applications that don't just work on plain text files, but um, all sorts of applications where different people collaborate on, on one shared document, be it wh whatever type of data that might be. So, this is all very exciting. Um, and this brings us to AutoMerge, which is our attempt to implement these ideas in, in a kind of practical way. So the way we think of AutoMerge is that it's, it's a bit like Git in the way that it tracks versioning of some data over time, and it allows branching and merging and so on. Um, the difference to Git is that, um, well, Git essentially operates on files as, as blobs and has a bit of merging logic for, for plain text uh, ASCII files. But apart from that, it, it just treats, as, uh, treats files essentially as opaque blobs. Whereas AutoMerge has a very explicit data model that it works with. Um, you can implement sort of relational database style um, uh, data with it, but it's most interesting for JSON-like uh, hierarchical data. And so you can express things like the to-do list that we saw earlier. And there's an API then for making changes to the current state of an application. And so in the JavaScript API, it looks like this. Uh, you call the automerge.change function, you pass in the current state of a document, and you get a callback. And within that callback, you can then mutate the state of the document in whatever way you like. Um, so you can, for example, decide to set uh, the done field to true. And uh, this API here, it, it uses immutable objects that are passed into the change object and you get back another immutable uh, object that has been updated with the changes that you just made uh, in the callback function. You can, if you want, you can attach a kind of commit message uh, to the change, which is just a descriptive text. It's, it's not used internally anyway. That's just, um, that's just for your own purposes for visualizing history if you want to do that. Um, and then Within this callback, uh, we uh, instrument the JavaScript objects in such a way that we can track exactly what changes have happened, and we can record those in such a way that we can propagate those changes to other users' copies of the document on other devices. <clears throat> and uh, so another example is now if I add, have the adding laundry, uh, uh, do laundry item, if I want to add that to my to-do list, uh, similarly, I would call a change function I call doc.todos.push, 
which is the, the JavaScript function for appending an item to a list. And I just provide the new object and append it to the list. So it's a, a fairly straightforward API for manipulating JSON, essentially. Now, the properties that AutoMerge provides is that um, you can have multiple users editing this data concurrently. And first of all, it just preserves every change that has happened. It records the change as operations, which means um, it doesn't just record uh, the final state after some changes were made, but it actually records exactly what was done in order to change the state from one state to another. And that's very useful if it comes to merging things then later, because it means we've actually tried to pick up the user's intention and the user input as closely as possible, which gives us meaningful ways of merging things. Moreover, we can guarantee that if two users have two, two divergent documents and they both merge it, then the results of the merge will always be the same. Um, another way of looking at this is that um, if I make some changes and somebody else makes some changes, I apply my own changes first and then the other person's changes later, whereas the other person applies their own changes first and my changes later, and we want to end up in the same state after we've exchanged our changes. And this is possible because we ensure that um, all of the, the operations that are done to the state are commutative. If, if the changes are concurrent, then, then they are commutative. And moreover, it gives us the ability to do this branching and merging and to inspect how the data changed over time, to visualize editing history and all those nice sort of things. Uh, so all of this is possible because auto merge is what's called a CRDT or a conflict-free replicated data type. There's been quite a bunch of research on CRDTs in the last 10 years or so, and uh, auto merge is, is one of the projects that, that's really trying to drive this sort of research forward. So I thought what I would try to do now is to, to place AutoMerge in context of various research projects that we've had going on here. Um, I've tried to put this on a kind of timeline over the last five, five six years or so um, that I've been working on it, and just try to, to put the various projects that, that I've contributed to uh, into this kind of map that shows how they all kind of fit together. And then we can decide later what which of those to talk about in detail. I can't talk about them all in detail because that would take days, if not weeks, but, um, but we can at least pick out some things that are interesting to folks. So uh, I tried to group this into roughly four categories. There's firstly the design of new algorithms for CRDTs. Um, secondly, then formal verification of those algorithms because some of those algorithms are very subtle and very easy to get wrong. And so we've applied formal proof techniques to make sure that those algorithms are actually correct. Um, then we've been working on real world implementation aspects. So that is actually making it work, trying to make it fast, make it memory efficient, make the network protocols work you know, reliably and so on. And then uh, finally, the security and privacy aspects like encryption. So I've had the fortune of working with a lot of really amazing people uh, on these projects and I'm going to list those people on the bottom. So starting here, uh, the, the way I came into this was uh, developing a CRDT uh, for JSON data. So, so previously there had been work on CRDTs for uh, data types such as lists and sets and counters and registers and things like that, but it hadn't really been put together into a tree structure like a CRDT, like a, like a JSON document where you can have arbit arbitrarily nested uh, lists and maps and other types of structures. So um, that was the first thing that, that I worked on in terms of CRDTs and uh, we published that in a journal in 2017. Around a similar time, I also started working with uh, Dominic Mulligan and Victor Gomez and Alistair Bersford on formal verification of some of those algorithms, uh, which we published in a paper at Uppsala and that actually got an award. Then around that time, we started working on AutoMerge and started taking those ideas that we had developed on the theoretical side and actually trying to implement them in, in practice. And so AutoMerge has been running since about 2017, has uh, developed quite a nice uh, com community of open source contributors um, who've added to this. Um, part of this is a Rust implementation. Thank you very much for your contributions, Andrew. Um, um, and we've also 
built a whole bunch of prototype applications over the years that use AutoMerge to actually provide different types of, of software. So one of them is like a, a graphics editor, one of them is, is a Trello-like project management tool, a couple of sort of note-taking tools, and then more recently, um, AutoMerge has been actually put into production use. For example, the Washington Post is now using AutoMerge for some of their internal collaboration workflows for the editors working on the homepage of the Washington Post website, uh, and so on. And, and this is, is building into quite a nice um, project with, with a good community around it. Now, in parallel to that, we've been continuing some of the theory work as well. So another thing we worked on was a move operation for CRDT trees. So with, with something like JSON, um, what we had initially defined was just you can create new subtrees, you can delete subtrees in, in a JSON document. We didn't have a way of moving a subtree from one position of a document to another. Um, the reason this is difficult is uh, you could have, for example, the following scenario. Say you have A and B, which are siblings in a tree, and one user moves A to be a child of B, while concurrently a different user moves B to be a child of A. And now you have to make sure that you don't actually don't accidentally create a cycle because if you have a cycle then it's not a tree anymore so uh, we designed an algorithm which uh, would ensure cycle prevention and also general good behavior for move operations on tree crdts um, that one took a long time to publish but we did eventually publish it in a paper this year let's move over to the uh, security side so one of the pieces of work we did there around 2018, 2019 was to actually articulate these local, the principles of local first software and to give the concept a name. Previously, we haven't really had a, a name to refer to it. Um, so we published that in, in uh, a conference called Onward in uh, 2019. Um, did some work with one of Alistair's PhD students, Stefan, um, on authenticated snapshots for CRDTs. So this was for the use case where you want to share a document with some new collaborators, but you don't want to actually share the full editing history. You just want to give them the latest state of the document without including data that was text, for example, that was inserted and then deleted again. And you still want to be able to cryptographically demonstrate the integrity of that. So to prove that, the, that this document is consistent with the editing history that came before. Um, this uh, approach, it turned out to be fairly cryptographically expensive, which is why we haven't actually put it into AutoMerge yet, um, but it was some, some very interesting foundational work. Um, then more recently, I've worked with Heidi, hello Heidi, hello. Um, on uh, Byzantine eventual consistency, and this is um, different ways of looking at it, but uh, what has made its way into AutoMerge is a data synchronization protocol that allows uh, two peers or two nodes to sync their, their state, their editing history for some document, uh, which is expressed in a kind of Git-like style. So you've got a, a hash graph of commits, essentially, and the devices want to exchange those updates in such a way that we can guarantee that they will converge to the same state, the same set of updates on both of the devices. And we want to provide that guarantee, even if some of the devices are misbehaving, and so some of them have Byzantine behavior and um, are not correctly following the protocol, we nevertheless want to ensure we can uh, want to ensure the guarantee, the integrity um, and the consistency of those documents in this, this case. And so that uh, we haven't managed to formally publish yet, but we've got a, a paper on archive and the protocol is already implemented in AutoMerge. Um, I then did some work with Matthew Weidner and Daniel Hugenroth and Alistair on end-to-end -end encryption for CRDTs. This is something we had sort of talked about for a long time, but hadn't actually got around to really working on actively for a long time. And so here we developed a, a key agreement protocol, which um, it has the crucial property of being decentralized. So a lot of existing work on secure messaging uh, has the problem that actually it assumes that all of your communication goes through a single central server which is exactly the sort of centralized infrastructure that we've been trying to get away with, uh, get away from with uh, CRDTs. And so we designed uh, an end-to-end -end encryption protocol that has the same strong security properties as Signal and WhatsApp and so on, 
um, but uh, has better scalability properties than some of them, um, but is also decentralized, so it doesn't assume any uh, particular server infrastructure. It, it'll work over any sort of network topology. Another project that is also related to this uh, is metadata privacy. And what I mean with that is hiding from network observers who is collaborating with whom. So this can be important in more sensitive uh, scenarios where people might be uh, reluctant to, to share publicly who they're talking to. This might be imp important for some political, in some political contexts or even uh, one embassy coordinating uh, with another embassy where they don't want to necessarily tell the world that they're talking to each other, but they are actually, they are actually collaborating. And so in that case, we want to use anonymity networks that um, hide who's communicating with whom. And these turn out to be also quite a good fit for CRDTs because uh, in anonymity networks, you don't want some central server that, know, that all of the communication goes through because that would undermine the whole point of having the anonymity network in the first place because that server could see who's working with whom. So we need a decentralized way of uh, exchanging the updates and CRDTs are perfectly suited to that sort of decentralized network. And so we can run CRDT protocols on top of an anonymity network and thus actually get some good, uh, good metadata privacy properties as well. Finally, the most recent thing that I've worked on um, with uh, Jeffrey Litt and Sarah Lim and Peter van Hardenberg is a CRDT for rich text data. And we just put um, a preliminary copy of that article online a few days ago. Um, so rich text means text with formatting, just exactly what you would find in Google Docs. And it turns out that you know, through the decades of research on collaboration systems, there's been very, very little work on rich text. It's, it's astonishing, but there are basically no algorithms out there for doing this. And so uh, we, first of all, had to um, figure out exactly what sort of merging behavior do we actually want when several people concurrently edit a rich text document and then actually find an algorithm that implements that behavior. Um, took us probably about half a dozen failed attempts of algorithms we designed, which then later turned out to be wrong before we finally found one that was right. But I think we did finally find one that is right. Um, that's currently just implemented as a prototype, but hopefully it'll make its way into auto merge as well before too long. There's lots more things that is currently, currently kind of work in progress of stuff that I'm currently exploring. That's things on more asynchronous collaboration workflows. For example, there's a, an interleaving problem you get with some text CRDTs where if people type text at the same place in a the document, then sometimes their insertions of text can get interleaved in a really weird way. Um, so we are working on an algorithm that uh, uh, that avoids this problem and this will involve formal verification as well to prove that the algorithm is correct because it's very very subtle um, so without proof i won't believe it uh, on the security side there's more stuff to be done on decentralized access control there's more work on making this anonymity network stuff practical and so on so tons of work going on but but hopefully this provides a little bit of an overview of just the world of research that, it, that is happening here and how it fits together now, is there anything particular, any questions so far? Or otherwise, um, I would suggest that I just go a bit more into how Automerge works internally and um, that might be interesting. Yeah, please do. So, uh, I mean, I'm coming from a background of the blockchain, where blockchain, the double spend problem really is sort of antithesis of Automerge. You can't merge it. It's either this or that. Exactly. You both. There's no way to reconcile those two history. Um, but if you have in, uh, so if you have a, a commutative transactions, which are in fact, then we can view, uh, uh, we can view a certain, <laughs> we can view sort of a blockchain as being the extreme case of having either a, a very precise history, mm -hmm. but you could also have a consistent history rather than precise history. So what I mean, for example, if you take a consensus protocol like the graph, mm -hmm. right? You said this is the law, and the leader says this is the law, and everybody has to have this law. What CRDDs perhaps allow you to do is to say, here's a set of laws which are all equivalent mm -hmm. in that they still have, at the end of it, if you do the transactions in that order, they will end up with the same uh, outputs because they're competitive transactions in between. So we don't have the uh, unique law uh, commands, but we have the unique uh, output 
the state. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's a very interesting kind of a philosophical mm. uh, uh, weakening yeah. uh, of, of, of a log structure, anything, log structure file system, log structure you know, transaction, yeah. or whatever. I mean, have you looked into that, or is that something that other people are looking into? Yes, um, I have thought about it a whole bunch. Um, one way of looking at it is that CRDTs do, do allow you to produce one, uh, like a single log, uh, yeah. an authoritative log. The difference is just that it's not final. So it could be that somebody else comes with some concurrent update and that has to be slotted somewhere into the middle of this log and, and the rest just gets moved along by one. So, um, so in some sense that uh, it, it gives you that one coherent log, you just um, you just don't know. Well, once you've synchronized up with all of the devices, yeah. then you know that the log up to that point is final. Right, right, exactly. So you have finality, so, but not at the tail, but you have finality. So we just take a blockchain, right? In Bitcoin, you have finality in a six deep. Yeah. So you can say this much deep, we have enough uh, latency, and with all the latency factors we take into account. But this far deep, it's final, and everything else after that is fluid. Exactly. Right? But, and and but the fluid part could be rolled back or could, could some be, conflicting right, data right, could right. turn up. Even importantly, the different uh, individual elements uh, and agents who are participating in this, I don't know if you want to call them, they could have inconsistent log uh, values as long as the operation outputs are actually consistent. In other words, the state is consistent, but not the log itself. Uh, yes, yes, exactly. And, and so what we're trying with CRDTs is to build abstractions on top of this sort yeah. of this uncertain log structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's the, two until it's uncertainty. One is actually you don't exactly know what's in the log. You don't need to. You just know mm -hmm. these operations and carried out in you know some order. Yeah, and, some, and then the second thing is you don't have finality until you've got the um, everybody agreed on. So I mean, it, it, it's uh, I'm looking at Heidi here because yeah. obviously this is very much related to consensus. I mean, and so this is sort of weird consensus going on. Yeah, the way I kind of see it, because you do tend to have causality in these systems, it's, it's not that there's no ordering, but just that it's a partial ordering right. as opposed to a total ordering, um, which I think is, is very nice because it's a lot more relaxed and it's also enough, it's enough for a lot of applications, it's enough for text editing, it's enough for group messaging, it's enough for a, a lot of things, it's not enough for a cryptocurrency. Yeah. But, <laughs> It turns out a lot of people, if you say you can't use it for cryptocurrency, they, they switch off and they don't care anymore. <laughs> um, but there are lots of cool stuff you can do with just that partial ordering. Yeah, in fact, one of the things that Heidi and I worked on together is a proof of what exactly is the property of applications that can be implemented on top of this CRDT partial ordering world versus which applications need the total ordering uh, of a blockchain and the Byzantine consensus. Right. Um, there's there's some ideas from the databases world that, that we take there in order to nail down precisely where where that dividing line is. Thank you. I shouldn't be really very much because no, it's fine. I mean, I'm I'm happy to talk about any of these things here. There's there's a there's a ton of stuff, um, but unless anyone has some further things they want to talk about, I'll maybe somebody in the audience has any views on this. So we, we could probably unmute yourself, and so we don't want to. Yeah, please feel free. Unprivileged users, you know. Well, I'll just yeah. go into some internals and I'll basically, I've got tons of material that I'll just okay. run until we're out of time and then okay. we leave it at that. Great, thank you. Um, so the question is what happens if you do an auto merge dot change call like this? Uh, what, what actually happens internally? And um, this is kind of like a systems development stuff. So I thought it might be of interest to folks here. Um, and so what happens is that turns into a log of operations and each operation is kind of like a microscopic, a microscopic um, description of something that changed. Like for example, the, uh, a single key was changed from uh, a certain previous value to a new value, or we inserted one item into a list at a certain position. And this uh, log of operations is then encoded as a byte array. And that byte array is then something we can save to disk and something we can send over the network. Um, so for example, if the, uh, if the task is to create this object here with two keys, the keys are title uh, and done, and the values are watering the plants and false, uh, the operations that, that, would, that would make that is, first of all, we make a new empty map object 
and that operation has an ID, then we assign the, the key title to the value, uh, sorry, the value water plant to the key title, and similarly for the key done, we just give each, um, each operation a particular ID. Then later on, if we come along and update that done field, uh, we in indicate which, uh, which operation overwrites which previous operation. And so the idea here is that each, each object is identified by the uh, ID of the operation that created that object. And you can think of it almost like a, like a reference or a pointer in a programming language, but just uh, in a way that works across machines. And likewise, uh, when you update the done field, there's an overwrites field which says which prior value of that same key is being overwritten. And this allows us to tell the difference between two overwrites that happened one after the other and two writes that are concurrent. So for example, if you have a, a to do's with a, a deadline attached to it and two users concurrently set that deadline field to two different values, then we want to detect that two different values were set there and that this is a conflict. And so the way this would happen now is each um, operation to assign a deadline would have an empty overwrites field because there's no prior deadline. And so we can tell that there are two different values being written to the same key and neither of them overwrites the other, and so they must be concurrent. And so this means now that uh, in the case of auto merge, what we do with concurrent things is we pick one of them by default based on their operation ID as the default resolution. But if you want to see what other values were written concurrently to the same key, you can get that information as well through a separate automerge.conflicts API call. Um, so the data model is uh, JSON plus a, a bunch of extensions, and uh, that compiles down into a bunch of operations for creating objects, setting and deleting keys in maps, inserting and deleting items from lists, um, and a few extra things like incrementing a counter, that sort of thing. Um, so you have no conditionals. What do you mean, no conditionals? So you so, can't say if this, then something. It's a role, uh, it's a role, it just seem to be manipulation, which are uh, imperatives with no something. Uh, so you, you can write in, in the code of the callback here where you have the doctor do stop push. Right. You can write arbitrary code there. So that can contain conditionals, whatever you like. Mm -hmm. um, but the only things that we record are the side effects, essentially, that, that you make. Um, yeah, there's sort of a, 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 I'll skip over this, talk more about the internals maybe. Um, so we structured this, um, that there are currently two implementations, a JavaScript implementation and the Rust implementation. Uh, the nice thing is that we can actually access the Rust implementation through WebAssembly from a JavaScript API as well. But the Rust implementation is also great for exposing the whole thing to different programming languages and different platforms. And so I expect that in the future, maybe the hopefully the Rust implementation will become the primary one, uh, as most platforms can support co Rust compiled to something suitable. And then we just have one code base and we can uh, implement the CRDTs really well once and then have that accessed from platforms across uh, from apps across a whole bunch of different platforms. Uh, Auto merge is just the data structure library, so it just deals with in memory objects. It doesn't by itself have any disk storage or any networking built in. It's got some sort of abstract networking protocols. They're not tied to any particular transport mechanism. So you could run the network protocol over WebSocket or over WebRTC or over a plain TCP connection um, or over many other things. Uh, any sort of messaging protocol would work really. Um, the way the storage format works is essentially you accumulate a log of changes. And so for a text document, Every single keystroke, for example, that you type might be a change, and that becomes a byte array that is encoded, saved to disk, sent over the network. And so that way you can have real time collaboration in the sort of Google Docs style. But you can imagine that this log of changes becomes quite big because with a text document, you can accumulate hundreds of thousands of operations. And so from time to time, what we want to do is to compress that operation log down into a compact snapshot. And then you can still have further operations building on top of that snapshot. and just like in a log structured storage engine, you periodically perform a kind of compaction process. And that compaction turns out to be remarkably um, effective. So we did a whole bunch of work on a, a custom data format, binary encoding format, 
that encodes the sort of editing history. Um, so we started with, um, as, as a benchmarking use case, this uh, a particular file where we just recorded the editing trace of uh, the latex source of the paper that Alastair and I wrote. And uh, we recorded every keystroke that went into editing this paper. And if we just write that out in a sort of naive JSON encoding, it's, it's huge, it's like 150 megabytes, we can gzip it and it compresses really well, but it's still pretty big. But with our custom binary format, we can encode the full editing history of this file. That is, we do have absolutely every single keystroke that went into the editing of this file, including a timestamp of when each keystroke happened, is recorded in uh, only about 300 kilobytes, which is less than one byte per operation. And the way that this compression works is uh, by borrowing some ideas from uh, columnar database systems. So we think of the entire history the entire editing history essentially one big table table in the relational sense and um, each row in this table is a single operation that happened which might be for example inserting or deleting a single character in a text document updating a single key in a map that sort of thing and we lay out these uh, operations in a particular order in particular in a, if it's a text document we lay them out in the order in which the characters actually appear in the final document this is still a CRDT and we can still merge uh, new operations into this simply by adding them to the table because this, this is just a monotonically growing set of operations essentially. But it also encodes really well because, for example, if you look at the, the operation ID, the operation ID is a combination of a counter, which is just an integer that increments, and the ID of the device that inserted that, that, that performed that particular operation. We encode those separately, so we look at just the counter values of successive operations, which tend to form these incrementing sequences, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we can, first of all, calculate the difference between one item and the following one, which then turns into runs of ones, typically, and then do a run length encoding on that. And the run length encoded data, we use a variable length byte encoding to pack that into bytes. And so that entire column we've represented in two, just two bytes now. Uh, for the for this column now it's even easier because we uh, even though each device that edits the document is identified by a UUID which is 128 bits but we can have a lookup ID which turns those long 128 bit values into short integers we run length encode those short integers again use a variable length encoding and again we're down to two bytes um, for the actual characters that were typed in a in a document well, we can just take the UTF-8 byte sequence and simply concatenate them and then use a standard compression scheme like gzip in order to compress the result. We do need to record uh, how many bytes each uh, insertion, each operation had, but that's just this length column here, which is just a bunch of ones uh, in typical ASCII text. If it was Chinese text, then it would be typically two bytes per, per item, but still it tends to be repeating uh, values and so we uh, end up with a, a very nice compact encoding for this again. Um, and that plus a bit of metadata is, is essentially enough to, to represent the full editing history um, of a document. Uh, it's not just for text, but it really generalizes to these arbitrary JSON structures very nicely. Um, the rich text CRDT work that we've done should also plug into this quite well. So um, that's essentially the, the basic idea behind it. Of course, there's a, there's a lot more work. I think I should probably leave it at that. Uh, and then I think we are running a bit short of time. So yeah. uh, thank you very much, Martin. Thank you. Uh, so we have time for a few questions. Maybe somebody from the uh, online audience wants to ask a question. You can unmute yourself. Okay, it's not spoken. Can we hear? Yes. Uh, when you were talking about the idea of synchronization with a cloud peer um, and being like if that one goes down being able to kind of switch uh, somewhat kind of transparently between them do, do you think that would mean you had some sort of federated identity between the two rather than or would you have to have multiple kind of accounts with different ones so i presume there would be just open access so just, uh, end up storing everything for everyone yes you, you would need some kind of form of like paying for storage presumably um I think the details of how exactly the authentication is done is 
kind of not too important, really. Um, so I think one, one reasonable model, for example, would be, say, if you're already paying for Dropbox, then Dropbox could just provide you an endpoint. It just needs to be an HTTP endpoint, and you type that URL into yeah. your app, and then it's using um, that particular service as your storage backend, and it just comes out of your Dropbox allowance. Um, and if you wanted to switch to, uh, say, Google Drive or whatever, then you could just do that easily by, by changing a URL or just so check the box. So you find your process on the user side. Yes, I, I think so. You could think of various ways of making it more user friendly, of course. Yeah. Um, you could definitely also have a federated system where you have data synced from one cloud provider to another. Um, there's absolutely no reason not yeah. to have that. I don't think it's, it's essential uh, to have that sort of federation, but um, it would be a pretty cool thing to explore. Um, certainly one thing that we have thought about is building on top of an existing federated protocol like Matrix, for example, which does a that's designed for sort of messaging, yeah. but um, there's no reason why your messages can't be CRDT updates, and that way you then provide collaboration on top of a federated messaging system like Matrix. Thank you. There's a question from Anna from Anne. Uh, Anne, do you want to go ahead, please? Sure. Um, what's next? So all, all Sorry, I can't hear you. Of... Uh, I'm un I am unmuted. Maybe I'll just read out your question. So the question, what's the next project looking to see what a new contributor could work on? Ah, okay. Well, it depends sort of which area you're interested in. And as, as you can see from the, the big map, there are lots of different areas of uh, uh, where activity is happening. Um, so let me just pull up that slide again. Um, so on the uh, on the, the auto merge side, um, there's a bunch of work. Like we're we're soon still in the process of trying to get a one dot release out, um, which involves various changes to APIs. And we're very interested in things like feedback on APIs for various different types of applications, how well it works. So if you want to, for example, build a prototype piece of software using auto merge and give us feedback or report any bugs you find, um, or any ideas for how the APIs could be better, that sort of thing is, is really valuable. Um, if you're more interested in like the theory and the research side, um, just get in touch with me, uh, let me know what sort of things you're interested in, and I can try and loop you into projects happening there. Um, if you're interested on the security side, again, there's, there's different people I'm collaborating with there, and sort of a whole bunch of ideas flowing, uh, floating around. Uh, generally, like my, my problem with this stuff has been too many ideas and too little time. So I'm, I'm very happy to give people ideas and um, projects to work on. And, uh, and so I'm very happy to share things. So just get in touch with what you're interested in. Thank you. Thank you. I can have a question, please. <laughs> um, there's a lot of hype on the internet nowadays well like work 3.0 and decentralized <laughs> apps and like they're going to replace all the classic apps with these decentralized things um, and this goes back to Ken Shelf's point about the fact that these kind of things always have a blockchain mm. like Ethereum or something that's the back end yeah. to the to these decentralized applications um, is also merge, do you kind of see also merge as being like an alternative model for like the back end storage for the kind of next generation <laughs> cool. I'm using a bunch of cool words that don't entirely know what they mean. <laughs> the next generation of kind of web 3.0 applications. Yes, I I think so. We we haven't been pitching it as such. Um, I find it a bit sad that a lot of decentralized stuffs sort of equated with Ethereum essentially. <laughs> um, because in my opinion, it's actually not decentralized at all because you're relying on the Ethereum blockchain, which is a, a thing of which there is one. Uh, so it's actually very centralized. You're relying on, on this one piece of infrastructure, even if it's no, provided in a distributed way. That's not exactly true. I mean, you have thousands of people who replicate them. So in fact, it is highly replicated. It's not fair to say it's only one of them. There literally are many thousands of copies. Each miner has a copy. Yeah, no, but there's conceptually, there's a, a, a single thing, a single log, a single transaction history. There's a single transaction history, but it is highly replicated. Yes. The whole reason for consensus is because it's highly 
Yes, but um, so for example, you can't just change the rules of it and decide to. No, so changing the rules is a different thing. I mean, that's governance, right? I mean, governance is, is obviously one of the weak points of any blockchain, but there are blockchains which have governance uh, built in, you know, with, 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 with elections and all sorts of very fancy stuff happening. Uh, yeah, and, and like if, if it's a cryptocurrency, then you absolutely need all of that. Right. Um, but for a lot of the software that we're looking at, like it's it's decentralized in a more radical way, which is like you have a code, some code running on your computer. You can change the code that your computer is running. Right. You, you don't have to coordinate with anybody else well, to change that. You can't change the you can't change the log format, right? You can't change the CRDT metadata format. Well, you, if you're relying on a, a uh, like if, if it's just a collab between you and your collaborators, you need to agree on the code exactly. format. Exactly, but there's, the there's no. Are you saying you have thousands of people who you don't know? Changing the blockchain rules is identical to changing the format of your auto merge binary representation. How do you decide that we're going to have a new um, operation? You know, you have you have create, map, delete, and so on. So but let's say it's a new operation that somebody wants to put in. It's going to require you to agree on how do you decide to change the uh, opcodes. I, uh, I guess maybe the difference is that. A lot of the collaboration software we're looking at is collaboration between fairly small groups of people. Yeah, yeah indeed. And so you only need to agree within that group of five people right. or ten people right. what right. you're That's, doing. So, but you don't need a global. Right, but in this new, you know, D app world, you essentially have the possibility of thousands of people, like you know, the people who got together to buy the constitution. Mm. Right. I don't know how many thousand people got together to buy it. Uh, they, could they use CRDDs to do this or automers to do this? Potentially, yes. I mean, they can edit a document which corresponds to the their agreement to buy. Um, but <laughs> I mean, but there's thousands of people who don't know each other necessarily. Yes. They only know each other without the keys. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. I mean, it, it, it's uh, so I don't think it's fair to critique Ethereum. I, I can critique on many, many different things, but mm -hmm. not on the lack of replication. Okay. Uh, yeah. But but I think it's a fascinating uh, topic, really, to see how these two worlds come together because. They are sort of philosophically apart, but not too far apart. So there's, there's this possibility of saying, well, you have, to, as I was saying, this, this uh, partial order, partial order uh, transaction history, which maybe there's something to it. I don't know. Yeah, so Heidi and I presented our work on this recently at, at a blockchain -y workshop run by Protocol Labs. Yeah. Um, in, in a bit of an attempt to try and Join the communities a, right. a bit, a bit more, right. um, because I, I feel like the a bit more exchange would be healthy, probably. So can I ask you one more thing? So how does the the uh, CRDD work? You know, the, the replay, the transaction order. It looks like RDDs and Spark, right? Isn't that similar? I mean, in that sense. Uh, in what way? In, in Spark, so it's, in, in Spark, which, uh, as far as I understand it, you have these data sets in, 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 in that where you. Uh, you aren't. Uh, you can replay transaction history to recon to recompute what your what your latest state is. So you have a checkpoint plus a replay history, and so the, the so you get in some sense you can think of the checkpoint being the finality, and then you have the replay history, mm -hmm. and the replay history allows you to. Uh, so the intuition being that, as I understand it, that keeping track of not the state but the state changes allows you to. Uh, essentially, uh, the performance that you're trying to do these uh, mm. data intensive, intensive operations. So, in that case, the the operations are transformations right. to the data set. That's right. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess there is a similarity there. I hadn't yeah. thought about that before. Okay. But um, I guess, like in, in the CRDTs, the operations are really the uh, the, the main thing that gets propagated. Right. Like, that's right. that's the real data. That's right. Uh, they're not really operating on a data set in, well, in some sense they are, I guess. They're, they're, they're sort of small updates to a data set, exactly. essentially. Yeah, okay. so it's, it's, they don't tend to be sort of analytic operations like yeah. grouping and counting. Exactly, and so yeah, these, are, these are more elementary operations, almost like uh, upwards in the byte by machine. Yeah. yeah, or a bit like um, transactions in the databases, right ahead right. log, yeah. that kind of thing. I, I, I have a fear, fear that I'm going to overrun the audience. I'm going to stop now, but uh, are there any other questions here locally? Or? Okay, well, in that case, let's thank Martin again. Hey, thank you. I, I, I love your slides. I don't know what you used to make them, but I, I, want, to, I want it.
<laughs> I, I draw them on an iPad. There's an app called Paper. Okay. Oh, so it's actually all hand drawn. It's all hand drawn. Yes. My goodness, you have excellent hand drawn. <laughs> okay. Any case, thank you very much, and that brings us to an end. We're going to stop the recording now. Okay. Good. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>